Okay, so we just talked about maternal conditions and those potential implications on a child's development um, during pregnancy. But we're going to learn about something called teratogens now. So what the heck is a teratogen? It's a fancy word for an environmental source of uh, potential birth defects and abnormalities and possibly even death. Um, so it can be serious, these teratogens. So um, let's, before we get into examples of them, let's first talk about some principles of a teratogen. So the effects of teratogens are going to vary based on the specific agent, but there are six general principles that apply to all of them. Um, so first being timing. When is the exposure of the teratogen occurring? Of course, the first two weeks at germinal period, it's gonna be the most vulnerable, right? We talked about that. Um, so if a teratogen is introduced during the, that time, it can actually just completely terminate uh, the organism. It won't develop any further. Um, organs are developing at different times as we learn. So they're gonna be more susceptible to teratogens during their prime time of development, right? So timing matters a lot. Specific effects, number two. So what this is saying is teratogen effects are often specific to a particular organ or area of development. Genetic vulnerability. So number three, uh, individuals differ in their susceptibility to teratogens based on their, you know, their genetics. Mother's physiological state. So for example, pregnant mothers are more susceptible to the effects of teratogens if they are younger than 20 years old or older than 40 years old. This is kind of associations found in research. Um, also nutrition and uterine condition, these can also make a difference. How much? So as it, in, how heavy is the concentration of the exposure? As we can probably guess, the greater the concentration, the greater the risk. And then mother-child effects will differ. So what this means is the effect of, the, of a disease, for example, on a mother might be minimal, but it could be major for the child. So rubella is an instance of this. Um, rubella, we'll talk about in more detail later, but it'll have little effect on the mother, but it'll have very serious effects on the child, um, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so that, that's what this last one means here. So these are all kind of things that apply to teratogens um, that all matter in the scope of what effect will the teratogens have on the developing child. So this is a little bit of an overwhelming looking diagram, but I'm gonna walk through it. So um, as we know, teratogens increase the risk for abnormalities or even death. So there are sensitive periods in prenatal development for the effects of teratogens as we talked about. Um, if, as you can see here, these first two weeks, prenatal death. So if a uh, teratogen is being introduced in these first two weeks during that germinal period, uh, the zygote won't survive any further. There'll be prenatal termination. Um, and as you can see later on, certain things are developing at different times. We just learned about all the different development. Um, so teratogens are going to have more pronounced effects at certain times of their development, depending on the organ that's developing. So the blue, so all of these little bars here that are half blue, half yellow, there are different areas of development, different uh, organs or systems that are developing. So the blue part of each bar is, the, is when there's the most risk of major abnormalities occurring. So it's that really sensitive period for teratogens. So if a teratogen is introduced during these blue periods of that certain thing's development, you're more likely to see a really big abnormality. Now the peach parts, peach colored second part of each bar, there's reduced sensitivity. There can still be effects on the child, but the risk is reduced if a teratogen is introduced at this time. So as you can see, the early phases definitely matter the most. Um, so what about specific examples of teratogens and their possible effects. Again, kind of an overwhelming slide, but we're gonna go through it. Um, so prescription drugs, many pregnant women in the US take over-the-counter meds. Most of them don't appear to harm the fetus. Some do, you'll see precautions on medicines if you know don't take this while you're pregnant. So you just follow those things. And for the most part, you'll be good. 
um, but an interesting, very tragic instance from the 1950s, I meant to put, not 60s, is um, thalidomide. So uh, thalidomide was given to mothers and children ended up being born with deformities. They were born without arms and legs. Some had sight and hearing defects. Um, and there was thousands of babies born with these deformities before the outcomes were traced back to the thalidomide and then it was removed from the market. So that's just one really tragic instance of, you know, prescription drugs can have an effect, but nowadays things are pretty regulated and tested for the most part. Tobacco, cigarettes, uh, nicotine, all that stuff uh, increases the risk for things like spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, neonatal death, um, birth defects too. Um, for example, abnormation, abnormal, sorry, abnormal formation of arms, legs, fingers. They're usually lower birth weight. Um, so there can be some pretty profound effects of that. And of course, the higher the dose, the more effects there are. Um, even secondhand exposure can affect uh, the health of the child. Alcohol, so heavy drinkers, um, their infant will likely be abnormal in some way. Uh, many of them suffer from something called fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And this includes abnormal physical features, hearing and vision problems, low intelligence. The most severe form of this is fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, this is very severe. It's an underdeveloped brain. You're going to see potentially congenital heart disease, joint anomalies, face malformations. So it could be very serious. Um, and the first trimester drinking will have the biggest effect with alcohol. Marijuana, so there's not a lot of definitive research to suggest birth defects for marijuana or like low birth weight or other things we've talked about from other agents. Um, it's often paired with other substances that are more, you know, heavy and hard. Um, so it can be hard to isolate the effects. Um, it may affect the placenta. There's some, some evidence that suggests it may affect the placenta's size, the larger growth, which could lead to potential neurological deficits. And then illicit drugs. Um, so things like cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin and methadone, otherwise known as opioids, um, can all have really profound effects on an infant. Um, we'll talk about heroin, I guess, as an example. Um, heroin is a... Uh, unique one because infants will actually be born addicted themselves if the mother was doing heroin and methadone or opioids. Um, they have to be given heroin or methadone shortly after birth to avoid life-threatening withdrawal symptoms. It's very sad. Um, while they're being weaned off this addiction, they're going to be irritable, have tremors, abnormal cries, sleep disturbances. Uh, it's a really rough period. Um, and there can potentially be some long-term developmental problems too. Um, so in summary though, take findings with caution as always. It can be difficult to isolate the effects of these things, but um, I think we can all agree it's good to keep you know, substance use to a minimum or avoid it altogether uh, during pregnancy to ensure the best outcomes of the child. Um, what about infections or other health conditions? These are other types of teratogens. It's not just drugs and substances. Um, so rubella, um, as I said earlier, mild symptoms for the mother, but it, there could be really devastating symptoms for the infant, especially if it's contracted uh, during the first 16 weeks of pregnancy. Um, so if this is the case, half of all children will exhibit uh, a syndrome with congenital heart disease, cataracts, deafness, um, and severe mental disability. And this is less likely though, if it, the exposure is after 16 weeks. If the mom is vaccinated for rubella, um, this is advised to avoid becoming pregnant for six, six months because of this. Um, so HIV AIDS, so there's, uh, more than a million children living with HIV. Uh, most of them are infected by HIV positive mothers. Um, and it's transmitted through the placental barrier, through exposure to the mother's blood during delivery, or even through breastfeeding. So there's, there's unfortunately a significant risk of not surviving 
in the first few years of life if it's contracted. And there's no, um, you know, HIV positive women um, can receive treatment though. And if an infant also receives treatment after birth and, you know, it's making sure that um, we're not breastfeeding or anything like that, they could pass it on. Chances of contracting it can be substantially reduced and the, the infant can end up being fine, but you have to take precautions. And then lastly, pollution. So areas with heavy atmospheric pollution uh, will often show abnormally high amounts of birth defects. Um, other associations are impaired development with verbal or motor skills um, or difficulty with behaviors down the road. Um, another area of concern is toxins in environment from bomb explosions and ammunition in, you know, war-torn areas. So this is all really heavy, I know, heavy way to end the day. Um, it, but, you know, it's important to cover just so we're, you know, educated on this stuff. Um, so we have fully covered prenatal development. Clearly, it's a very important period. A lot of implications for development after birth. Um, but next time, we're going to talk about the actual birth of the child and the newborn. Um, so that's where we're heading next time. So again, I know we ended on a heavy note, but next time it'll be a little lighter and um, not quite this heavy. So thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll see you next time.